good day to you all. Today, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, volcanic architecture of mafic and ultramafic lava flow fields and uh, how they can potentially be used as an exploration tool in, for commodity hosted nickel sulfides. The aim in this presentation is to demonstrate that the basic principles of volcanology, such as the architecture of lava flow fields and or lava facies uh, associations, can be utilized as an effective exploration tool. This approach has been co coined as applied volcanology and uh, um, would be very interesting to develop further. Now, I will start with a, a, a brief introduction to nickel sulfides and, and, and chromatide hosted ores. Uh, from that, talk a little bit about uh, the nature and importance of insulated lava emplacement, uh, followed by volcanic architecture of power hole flow fields and and how endogenous growth works. Then we'll try to link that to the volcanology of commodities and then see how we can use this new understanding of power hole to actually uh, uh, further our understanding of commodity and emplacement and more importantly of ore formation. Now, as you all might know, nickel uh, sulfide ores are typically associated with mafic and ultramafic magmatism. Uh, they, in the simplest form, are formed by segregation of an immiscible monosulfide melt from the, the host magma or host lava. Uh, this immiscible sulfide scavenges nickel and other chalcophile elements from the host uh, silicate magma very efficiently. The, uh, the partition coefficients for nickel and especially PGEs is, uh, into sulfide melts is very, very high. And uh, uh, therefore, it's a very effective way of actually concentrating these elements uh, and into uh, uh, an ore body. Uh, the origin of these immiscible sulfides and, 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 and associated ores are linked to high temperature processes and, and have either been linked to magma fractionation and mixing uh, or contaminant or contamination or assimilation of, of uh, felsic uh, substrate into the commodity magma, which if happened, it happens, it will lower the, the sulfur solubility in those uh, magmas and hence may uh, promote formation of immiscible sulfides. Now, the, the typical sulfide ore forming environments uh, are shown here in this very simplistic sketch. The uh, green areas show uh, uh, ultramafic magmas that are intrusive in origin, origin either plutons, dikes, or sills. And uh, the bright green is a, 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 sub, is a surface in place lava flow. And uh, because the immiscible sulfur melts are usually denser than the host melts, the, uh, the sulfide uh, melts will then accumulate at the bottom of these bodies or the base of these bodies, I should rather say, and, uh, uh, and most of the ore bodies are typically located towards the, the base of these individual formations. Now, the brown layers there indicate they're just the sulfur rich strata that might add to the, the sulfur budget of the magma that is rising through the crust. So, effective traps for uh, nickel sulfide ores are magma holding chambers, plumbing systems, and uh, lava pathways within large lava flow fields. Uh, the examples that I will be uh, focusing on take all come from Western Australia. Uh, more specifically, they are within the uh, 2.7 billion year old Norsem and Viluna greenstone belt in Western Australia, which hosts some of the uh, uh, major nickel finds in, in, uh, uh, on Earth, uh, including Honeymoon Well, uh, Mount Keith, uh, Cosmos, Perseverance, uh, Black Swan, and Kambalda. Kambalda is, of course, one of the 
or famous sites. Uh, in this presentation, the example that I will be using, they come primarily from Black Swan, which is uh, uh, a commodity body, which is uh, a small commodity body, relatively small commodity body that is situated within Felsic Volcanics in the Aurora Domain in, in Western Australia, and also from Cosmos and a bit from Perseverance. Uh, the Cosmos uh, deposits are, are, are an offshoot from the, the lunar Norseman belt, uh, slightly older than the uh, uh, the other de uh, uh, deposits known from the Greenstone belt, uh, ranging in age from 27, 2,724 to 2,736 million years, while the others are closer to 2,700 million years. Uh, Commodias typically host two types of ores, uh, the type 1, which is a sulfide-rich accumulation at the base of the magma pathways, as shown in this diagram here. You can see the massive ore uh, overlain by uh, uh, an offer to mesocumulate sequence, and, uh, and which is again cut by a very thin spinifex sequence, and a type 2 ore, which is disseminated sulfide, which are basically distributed through the uh, Olive in meso to add cumulant that uh, occupies the the uh, um, pathway, and uh, typically these pathways where you have the ores are, are flanked by thin spin effects texture flow logs. And here's just another uh, more examples from uh, Western Australia of, of uh, type one type nickel sulfide ores. Uh, but in general, they are all resting on, these massive sulfide ores are resting on the silicic or more felsic substrate and uh, uh, overlain by uh, cumulates, typically mesocumulates to add cumulates, and uh, flanked by spin effects textured uh, flows. The, uh, the association, the Felsic Commodity Association that was shown on the previous slide is actually quite important because most of these commodity flows, they actually are very closely associated with Felsic volcanic rocks. They seem to be resting on such rocks and because they are very hot and very fluid, they can fairly easily thermally erode these uh, uh, Felsic substrate and hence uh, you can mingle felsic material into the commodity lava and that results in lowering the sulfur solubility of the commodity and you start to form immiscible sulfide uh, blobs. These immiscible sulfide blobs, as I said earlier, will uh, uh, extract nickel uh, copper and, and, and platinum group elements from the commodity lava and uh, uh, if they're large enough they will gradually sink towards the base and uh, uh, form a massive sulfur ore or they can stay in suspension and form a disseminated ore. And uh, when we look at the geochemistry of many commodities we always find a good indication of actually this uh, assimilation of felsic material it actually shows up quite nicely in the, the composition of the uh, flow units which are closest to Felsic Dots. And it, it typically, in, 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 when you look at a commodity uh, 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 ore environment, you will see that the massive ore bodies are, are actually quite closely linked to disseminated ore bodies, and these both of these will be closely associated with uh, uh, ortho to add cumulates that represent major pathways for the, the lava or the magma uh, where it moved through. So you will have a lot of lava slash magma moving through these pathways. And uh, uh, as you do that, the uh, uh, basically the felsic substrate will see a lot of lava. So if you have sustained flow of lava through there, you can actually thermally erode a significant amount, and hence you can generate a significant amount of disseminated, sorry, immiscible sulfide, 
which can result in disseminated or massive all bodies within these transport systems. And typically these, again, are flanked by spin effect text tube uh, uh, flows. And it is this association of a major pathway where the, the lava moved through uh, uh, that is flanked by thin spin effect text tube flow that sort of a made a loud hill and his co-works actually made this leap towards looking at uh, uh, commodities from a more modern viewpoint. Basically what they did, they threw out the idea, is it possible that commodities lava flows were in place in a similar fashion as modern day Pahauehoe flows are in place as we see in Hawaii and in Iceland? And in order to explore this further, we need to actually have a bit better understanding of the uh, emplacement of power power flows. And it should be stressed that in the last 20 years, our understanding of how power power lamas are emplaced has changed enormously to the, to the extent that actually it has caused a fundamental change in our views of lava flows. And basically, we now think that the mode that the power holy lavas are in place is the fundamental mode of lava in place on planet Earth and has been so throughout its history. And that's the case that I'm going to bring to you with now going through some of the key features of power holy lobes. Let's start by looking at a video that actually shows uh, a Pauihoe lava being emplaced at Kiloea Volcano in Hawaii. And take a note that actually as the lava advances forward, it actually advances lobe by lobe, even though that process sometimes seems a bit hazardous, uh, haphazard. And uh, also, at the same time, this lava is thickening by inflation within. But also take note that the upper crust, which is formed almost immediately on top of these flows, is stationary. The lava is moving underneath a stationary crust. These are several key features in terms of understanding how power hole flows are in place. Also note that this uh, uh, time lapse is from Ken Hon at the University of Hilo. Uh, is actually uh, taken over four hours, even though we show it in, in, in less than a minute. Here we go. So here is the lobes coming down, they're breaking down, and take a note that they are merged together and form a continuous liquid sheet which continues to inflate behind the actively moving forward front. And so we actually start to have a form formation of a sheet lobe with a continuous liquid core that keeps... Apologies for that. Let's try this again. And here you see them moving and take a notice behind the advancing lobes, the lava keeps inflating and it actually inflates as a continuous sheet. So the core has actually merged together to form a continuous sheet, hence the term sheet lobe that we will use later on. And it keeps inflating and actually this process can actually make the, the final lava um, five to ten times thicker than it was in the beginning. Now, let's examine a little bit more the uh, uh, insulated emplacement um, mechanisms, uh, the endogenous growth, if you like, so emplacement of lava by endogenous growth, as we sometimes refer to it. But here, let's start with the, the sort of the larger scale features, and here is a... Um, a slide that is actually sort of comparing uh, power hole to AA, both in terms of how the the, the lava is, is in place, but also in terms of, of uh, how much lava is coming out of the vet per unit time or, or the magma discharge. And to our left here, we have the uh, discharge plot over six years, for the first six years of the Puo'o Kupayanaha eruption uh, that just ended this year, 2018, lasted for 35 years. Um, so in the first three years, we had uh, episodic activity 
with a fairly high magma discharge, over 350 cubic meters per second, forming fast-moving AA flows. But none of these AA flows, as you can see here to the right, reach the ocean, despite the fact that they had quite a high flux behind them. And the reason for that is because lava, in this case, flows in an open channel, and these are thermally efficient flows. They lose heat too rapidly. They stiffen too quickly. Therefore, they typically short flows. They don't go very far. They might move fast, but they don't go very far. Now, in 1986, activity shifted from Pu'o'o over to the lava lake of Kupayanaha. At the same time, the magma discharge dropped to less than 20 cubic meters per second and was very, very steady. It was modulated by the lava lake. So you were feeding lava from this lava lake into the lava flow field at a very steady pace for the next three years. Despite this low discharge, order of magnitude lower than in case of the AA flows, it actually the lava marched downslope and reached the ocean within three years. It actually almost flowed twice the length of the longest AA flows in the same amount of time, despite this huge difference in the magma discharge. So clearly, the magma discharge is not the key element in terms of determining how far lava flows go. It might be a key factor in determining how fast they flow, but not how far they go. What is a determining factor is that the transport system, in case of power hole lavas, is insulated. It's a lava tube or an internal pathway. It's completely insulated from the outside environment. And that kind of situation is ideal to form long lava flows or very long lava flows. It just takes time. And if we look at this even, even further, and here we are looking at a map of the Pu'o'o lava flow field in 2017. And all this gray area that on this map is lava that have been formed since 1983 up to 2017. The pink area is the lava that was active up until November uh, 22nd as a flow field, and the yellow lines that show the if you see here the yellow lines here, these are the tube or the internal pathways that are feeding the lava, or feeding this lava to the active flow front. Uh, in this case, went all the way to this ocean entry here. Uh, and the red areas here are the part of the flow field that was active on December the 12th. And even though they don't show visible link to the transport system, they have to be linked to the transport system. And uh, so lava is really just flowing through this transport system and uh, feeding these sporadic active flow fronts. And this is actually quite interesting because it, it, it demonstrates one very important thing. In any lava flow field which is forming, only a small portion of it is actually moving lava. Most of it is actually stagnant or solidified lava, as is demonstrated here, and even demonstrated even better on this image here, which is a thermal image of the same flow field, and we can see the red areas which are hot and the blue areas which are cold, and even the, th even the transport system, which was drawn in the yellow lines in previous slide, don't show up here. That's how well insulated this, this transport system is. And just to sort of uh, point out some key features in terms of uh, the structure elements of, of a Pahoehoe flow field, uh, the flow field is typically comprised of lava flows, several lava flows, where each lava flow either originates from different fissure segments at different time or from the same fissure segment but at different times. So there's a, a, a pause between uh, uh, times of emplacement. And each of these lava flows are actually comprised of many, many lobes. And the main lobes are what we call sheet lobes, which are the largest one indicated here in, in light gray. And of course, these lobes were fed by a, a, a transport system or some form of lava tube system. 
Uh, and, uh, and as is illustrated here on the lower one is that active transport system or the lava tube, which is feeding lava from uh, um, the active vent to the active flow front. And they can do so fairly rapidly. A transport system like this can transport lava from the vents to active flow from over hundreds of kilometers in days. It would be very difficult to form the whole lava flow field in days, but taking an element of lava from here to here can take a relatively short time. Another feature of this uh, transport system that is important to note is that we have wide areas and we have narrow areas. We have pools, we have chutes. And this is an artifact actually of the lobe emplacement. Every time a lobe breaks out, it actually breaks out through a fairly narrow uh, uh, opening and spreads out fairly rapidly. So uh, uh, the, as the uh, uh, flow concentrates within the lobe, the, uh, it covers a relatively larger area within the central part of the lobe and a narrow area towards the margin. So the system will have this shoot and pull, and this is actually quite important when it comes to thinking about uh, um, mineralization in uh, uh, commodity power flow fields. The this transport system is actually quite amazing. It's very, very uh, uh, effective in terms of insulation. So lava is a very good insulator. Here on, on the left, you can see a, a lava tube or an internal pathway in the, in the uh, pool or lava flow field on Kilauea Volcano. And uh, we see here through a skylight the, the incandes incandescent lava in, in that pathway. And that is feeding the active flow front, which is down here, 11 kilometers away, um, entering the ocean. Nowhere in between do we see incandescent lava. And when you keep a transport system insulated like this, it means that the mode of transport is very thermally efficient. The cooling is less than 0 0.1 degree per kilometer. So basically, we can get hot, very hot lava from the vet down to an active flow front uh, um, in a very short period of time. And that is why these flows can continue growing for such a long time. It is not a problem because they don't really cool that much in the transport system. It's only when they break out of the transport system they start to cool. And Laszlo Keste demonstrated this uh, in, in a nice thermal modeling study of uh, 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 tube fed lavas in 1995. And basically these conclusions were that in order to produce 100, uh, more than 100 kilometer long lava, the flow only need to be 5 to 20 meters thick. The uh, flow velocity on the order of uh, uh, 0.2 to 1.4 meters per second or less than 5 kilometers per hour advance. All of these values are within what we would think of as a, as a normal uh, uh, lava producing eruption taking place on planet Earth today. And same can be said about the discharge, which is he estimated that, that in, in the range of 50 to 5,000 cubic meters per second, um, which is, again, what we observe from modern day eruptions. So it's no problem when you have a, a, a thermally insulated transport, there's no problem making long lava flows. The other thing about those insulated transport systems is that they are sealed off from the outside environment. The outside environment has a minimal impact, not only on the temperature of the lava, but also everything else that is within that system. Uh, the lavas construct their own transport system. They start this and do this step by step, lobe by lobe emplacement. Each lobe, as it breaks out, will spread out. It will flow over slightly undulating subsurface. Wherever the lava is flowing over lows, that's where the flow will be concentrated. When it flows out high, there's going to be less flux through there because the upper surface of this lava is relatively flat. And when you do, you keep doing this, it means that the lava is cooling from the top and the edges and also from the bottom to some extent, but also you're reducing flow of lava through 
over the highs, and that will actually also result in stagnation of the lava. So you end up with a system that where you have concentrated flow of lava into discrete internal pathways, and eventually one of those pathways will become the, the one that actually becomes the main extension of the overall transport system that feeds the lava to the active flow flow. And step by step, the lava just takes these pathways longer. And as I said earlier, the, at the active flow front, the lava is in place lobe by lobe. You have a lobe come in that will uh, uh, spread out laterally. It will, front will sort of stiffen up and it will start to slow down. That means the, the influx here is going to respond to that slowing down by basically starting lifting up the surface. And as it does that, it will actually also start to uh, uh, accrete to the base of the crust of the crust is thickening, the core is thickening, and, and the lava is inflating at fairly uh, uh, rapid pace. Uh, eventually, there's going to be another breakout. New lobe is forming. You repeat that process this way, and this is where I've best been demonstrated by this simple animation, where you see lobe by lobe emplacement. And take a notice here, the, as the, the lava is breaking out, the crust is thickening with time from below. And, uh, and initially, the core of the, the liquid part also thickens, but then reaches an equilibrium. And this is how you lengthen the transport system. So these lobes that break out of the front are spread out. The flow of lava will concentrate in, in a distinctive pathway, will become an extension of the transport system. And this is sort of illustrated here in this simple animation as the lava is getting concentrated in a single pathway because of the rate of cooling of the, uh, uh, the lava from all sides, as well as the effects of, of a slightly undulating substrate. Lava evolves further, and, and uh, the, the transport system, or the lava tube, if you like, uh, when it's full, it's actually pressurized. So there will be excess pressure in it, and it and so it is not going to be vesiculating or degassing or anything. It uh, uh, actually exerts pressure on its environment, and because it's pressurized, it also can form lateral breakouts that actually come from the sides of the transport system and uh, flow onto the the pre-existing lava, the earlier formed lava. And uh, so you have here growth from the sides of the, of the transport system, which actually thickens the lava, and then we have the growth at the active front, flow front, which is primarily lateral. And if the flow of this lava uh, through this transport system is sustained over a, a period of time, uh, and uh, studies show, for example, in Hawaii, if we have a, a steady, sustained flux of lava through a tube for more than two months, it will start to thermally erode its substrate its own lava substrate. So it's basically a thermally eroding lava of similar composition as itself. And that's actually quite amazing. So when we think of Comadia as being emplaced onto felsic substrate, it would be that much easier for the Comadia lavas to actually thermally erode such substrate. And this can also be illustrated again here by a fairly simple animation. We concentrate the flow of lava into a distinctive pathway. That's where the inflation takes place because it's pressurized and we get lateral breakouts from it. But this sustained flow through flow of lava will also heat up the substrate and that will result in thermal mechanical erosion. And uh, at that time, the, uh, uh, as the lava sort of subsides down, the pressure will drop in the in the in the transport system because it now does not manage to maintain a full uh, tube, so to speak. So the pressure at the top drops, and basically that what that means is that the inflation above of the roof above that uh, that tube will stop. And now I've shown you cartoons, and just to basically demonstrate that. This kind of thermal erosion does take place. This is an example from uh, uh, Mauna Loa, Hawaii. There's one of the coastal flows. And uh, here to the right, we can, the, the, the white broken lines show the base of the lava 
that actually hosts this uh, uh, lava tube or this transport system, uh, which has been exposed here by erosion of the coast. And if we look at to the uh, the left, we can see that the original tube is up here. That's the level of the original tube, which is basically at the level of this flow. And uh, at some point, the lava had flowed long enough and steadily through this tube that it actually started to thermally erode its substrate. Lavas of similar composition, and it actually thermally eroded several meters down. This is about sort of two and a half to three meters down. And again, this all just demonstrates that sustained flow of lava through a transport system can easily result in thermal erosion of the surface. We don't need turbulent flow. All we need is sustained uh, uh, flow at a fixed flux and even of its laminar. Now, just to sort of take, put, pull this all together, Here's a cartoon uh, that is taken from, uh, uh, in part from a, a paper by Hornetal, 94. It's a seminal paper on, on, on lava inflation and also uh, uh, studies that were conducted by Steve Self and, and uh, myself and, and colleagues in, uh, in 98. Now, if you look at this schematic uh, image here, which is actually showing growth of a, a, a breakout, in uh, in the Puo'o lava flow field, uh, this particular lobe I think was formed in 1991, and it's breaking out from a, a, a pre-existing lobe here, which is to the right, shown in black. And initially, this lobe spread fairly rapidly across the uh, the land in in. in Across the, across the land as a very thin sheet, as is shown here on, on, on the top diagram, number one. And as it is moving, the crust is starting to form on it, and that crust is in part made up of a brittle crust and also a viscoelastic crust, which is shown here in green. And that viscoelastic part is strong enough to actually hold this crust up so the lava can move freely underneath without moving the crust, so the crust is stationary. And of course, this crust is also formed here at the front. And as that crust thickens and stiffens, it slows down the advance of the lateral advance of, of, of the lobe. And what happens then is that you continue pumping lava into, into this lobe, into the core of this lobe. And so it starts to inflate. It starts to lift up the upper crust. And initially, that lift up or that inflation is a function of thickening of the liquid part of the lava as well as thickening of the upper crust by growth from below. At some point, the influx of lava into the liquid core uh, equates the outflow, so new breakouts are formed downstream, and from then on, the liquid lava will maintain its uh, uh, uniform thickness, will maintain uniform thickness, but it, the inflation will continue at a slower rate by cr growth of the crust from below. And, and each time you add an element to the crust, you will lift it up to actually maintain the uh, thickness of the, of the liquid core. And this is how these lavas form and they thicken uh, uh, with time. So they actually, at the end, they are about five to ten times thicker than what they started out be, to be, but also this also forms in the end continuation of the transport system. So this part here, the liquid part, you will concentrate the flow in a certain area and, and that will help lengthening the, or continuing the transport system. Now here's a little sort of a, just for, for fun, this equation here where T is time and C is the crust thickness, Basically, because the crust grows according to uh, conductive cooling, it also is a measure of time. So basically, by measuring the thickness of the crust, you can measure the emplacement time of the lobe. And these structures are really visible in 
power hole lobes wherever you look at them. This one here is an example from Columbia River. And what we have here is, uh, you know, marked by the yellow arrows is uh, a one single sheet lobe within uh, uh, one of the flow fields in Columbia River, Flood Puzzle Province, in, which is in course in northwestern United States, and is the youngest Flood Puzzle Province on Earth, uh, primarily formed between 17 and 14 million years ago. Uh, this sheet lobe here, the massive part, which is the uh, shown here as the lava core, that's the part that was liquid during lava emplacement. The lava crust, this irregular thing up here, purple colored, extending out to there, that's the upper crust, the vesicular upper crust, and uh, uh, that was the crust that grew on this lava during emplacement. And uh, uh, so that is the stationary crust that was on this lava growing. Uh, during emplacement, and it's basically a measure of how long this lava was being emplaced. In this case, it's 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 uh, uh, roughly about about six months. Um, and then, of course, we have basal crust, which is sort of a, a, a miniature version of the upper crust. Features of the upper crust is that it does feature uh, very distinctive vesicularity, which I'm not going to talk about much right now, but also crystallinity. So it's actually really glassy at the top. It's hypohyaline. But the crystallinity increases relatively sharply downwards, and at the base of this crust, we have a holocrystalline a, a lava. And this is just a reflection of the of the, basically of the growth rate of the crust and and uh, uh, how well the lava is actually gradually becoming insulated. The core, on the other hand, has a very uniform crystallinity. Now these lobes, they're not necessarily on the scales of a few tens of centimeters. Some of them are. Uh, down to a few tens of centimeters, but most of them are actually in the range of one to one hundred meters thick. So these are, you know, individual emplacement units or cooling units, if you like, but they are very large. And in an outcrop like you see here, a one lobe can actually look like a single lava, but it's actually is part of a, a, a much larger flow field where you have multiple lobes of this size. So there's another lobe over here, and there's another lobe underneath, and all of these are part of the same lava flow field. These structures that I've been just briefly describing, they, you find them in Pahu Hohe lavas all over Earth, of all ages, sizes, and composition. You find them in the Deccan, the Columbia River, the North Atlantic Igneous province, province, including Iceland, in Hawaii, in the Snake River Plain, the Oslo Rift, any Archean and Proterozoic provinces you, you, you can look for. I mean, these lavas are there. And here we have just two examples, one from the Oslo Rift, it's a basinite, very thin basinite flow lobe, where you have the massive core with uh, uh, some segregated vesicle cylinders in here. So those vesicle cylinders contain a segregated material highlighted by a secondary mineralization. And then above that, you have the horizontal vesicular sheet, which is basically fed by those cylinders and fed laterally at the base of the crust, which is here above it. Form, which was formed on this lava during emplacement. So this was liquid. The cylinders rose up through it. When they hit the base of the crust that had been growing on the lava during emplacement, they spread laterally. Sorry about that. And the other picture here is basin and range. Um, lava, chalcali basalt, just showing the typical inflated uh, margins of, of, of a seed lobe, and you can see how flat surface it is. Now, Many people say, well, big lavas and the big lava flow fields of big lavas, they must have a different way of forming than in small lavas. And uh, the example I'm going to use here to try to demonstrate to you that that is not the case is the Rosa lava flow from the Columbia River. It's a 14.7 million year old flow field and uh, formed over a period of 10 years. It covered 40,000 square kilometers, has a volume of 1,350 kilometers. And drawn on there to scale uh, uh, to, to give you an idea of how big these things are, are the two of the largest uh, lava, recent lava flows on uh, the big island of Hawaii, Puuo'o, as it was uh, in the year 1996, and the uh, largest Mauna Loa lava flow in historic time, the 1859, which is 0.27 cubic kilometers. Also drawn there are the three largest holes in lava flows in, fissure-fed holes in lava flows in Iceland, the uh, 
1783-84 Lucky, 934-40 Elkja og Lava Flow Fields and Long with the 8600-year-old Thjórsá Lava Flow Fields, which is 24 cubic kilometers. So even these really, really big holos in Lava Flow Fields, they are dwarfed by this Rosa Lava Flow Field. Now, is it different? Short? No. It features the same basic architectural components or structural components as small lava flow fields. Here we illustrate that by the showing the ROSA. It actually features several lava flows. Each of those lava flows comprised of multiple lava lobes or sheet lobes. Same thing for Puo. -o. Multiple lava flows shown in different colors. And each of those lava lobes made up of multiple lava lobes, seed lobes in other words. Despite the difference in size, which is factor three, sorry, uh, three orders of magnitude, I should <laughs> be correct. Um, they, the fundamental architecture is the same. When we go and look at the internal structures of the lobes, we do see the same thing. Irrespective of size, these lo lobes have the threefold structure of the lava crust, lava core, and the basal crust. The features that you see and measure, and these are accurately measured you know, uh, uh, section through these uh, lobes, measured on a decimeter scale in each case. And basically, they all have the same fundamental structure. It's just the difference is scale. All it is, the difference is scale. And if you take the small Hawaii lobe here, on the left, it's only 2.7 meters, and you stretch it up, it will fit almost perfectly onto this Columbia River lobe here, which is usually 18 meters thick. This, to me, is not only amazing, but also demonstrates that the fundamental process that forms these lobes is the same. The mode of emplacement for both of them is identical. So basically, the way power holy flows are formed by endogenous growth and inflation is a fundamental process for lava emplacement on planet Earth. And actually, if we look closely also on Mars. Now, I want to talk a little bit about commodity volcanology, and what I more or less say here is, is uh, mostly from uh, uh, the work that has been was done at the Magmatic Ore Deposit Group at CSIRO by Rob Hill, Steve Barnes, Sarah Dowling, uh, Catherine Perring, and Terry Matters, and myself to uh, uh, some extent. So what is a commodia? A commodia is uh, a term was first used by Villion and Villion in 1969 to describing an ultramatic volcanic rock from part of the South Africa. And they noticed that these uh, rocks, they had a very distinctive spin effects the textured upper part, as shown here. You can see the, all the plated, bladed and, and feathery olivines um, typifying the spin effects. And accumulate lower part here, typified by a, a, an image of an orthocumulant, only an orthocumulant. The name comes from the type locality, which is the Komati River in, in, in South Africa. Mineralogy of these uh, uh, lavas is, is uh, typically olivine, um, sometimes a little bit of pyrocene. Uh, they are characterized by a very high magnesium content, typically over 18 weight percent. Melt composition typically around, or not typically, often around 30 uh, weights in magnesium. Uh, the very low and incompatible element concentrations. Uh, these are very hot lavas, low viscosity fluids, and uh, uh, can therefore move fairly easily uh, under gravity. The Crystal structures that you saw, in, to an extent, ref, uh, uh, reflect different morphology. So the lower part, the cumulative part, is typified by polyhedral olivines, which are grow uh, uh, at low cooling rates. So in an environment where the, the, the lava or the magma is cooling fairly slowly. Whereas the, the spin effects textured dendritic olivines, plated olivines, 
are indicative of a very high cooling rates, indicating that they were formed uh, uh, when exposed to uh, a much cooler environment. And then we have morphologies that range in between. So basically the morphologies to one extent are re a reflection of, of uh, the growth environment and, uh, and, and the, or the cooling rates in the growth environment. The textbook Commodia Lope, uh, as uh, uh, demonstrated by Arndt, uh, is shown here, and where the upper part is the spinifex zone, and it uh, divided into three zones from, from A1 to A3, where the the A1 is a very fine-grained random spinifex, so you have small bladed olivines in a random orientation, uh, grading into uh, A2, which is the same kind of thing, just medium, slightly larger crystal, medium-grained random spinifex, slightly larger crystals. And uh, but whereas A3 things change uh, quite dramatically, now the olivine blades and plates are actually uh, uh, vertically orientated and quite uh, organized and uh, uh, form this what sometimes what is referred to as bookshelf spin effect. The lower part is typically uh, accumulate forms of polyhedral olivine crystals and uh, uh, sort of a typically either massive or even slightly layered orthotomesocumulate in, in, in nature. Towards the base, you often see a, a, a penced, very fine-grained penced base that sometimes may contain uh, uh, random spin effects. Now, this is actually quite interesting because if you think about uh, the story of inflation before, is that if, if we think of commodity lavas as being inflated, maybe then this transition from uh, uh, orientated sort of vertical spin effects, sorry, from random spin effects to more oriented uh, spin effects might reflect uh, uh, the time when the liquid core reaches equilibrium because of steady through flow. But we'll come back to that a little bit later. I should point out that the typical thickness of these uh, spin effects dominated lobes is, is in the range of 1 to 15 meters. Uh, when we look at the composition, uh, here to the left, we're just showing a sort of typical melt composition for, for a commodiat. Uh, Lava, or at least that's the people have estimated the melt composition. What is noteworthy here is the uh, low silica content, uh, low uh, aluminum content, and very, very high magnesium content of 38%. Now, this is a, it's also interesting to look at how the, the uh, uh, concentrations of element change in a vertical profile in a typical lobe. This is actually a very typical profile for both spin effects textured or spin effects dominated lobes. Commodiate lobes. Um, magnesium is reasonably steady, right around sort of 25 to 30 percent throughout the most of the uh, the spin effects textured horizon, changing abruptly uh, to uh, uh, over 40 percent in the cumulative part of the lobe, uh, where it is actually fairly uniform at 40 plus percent. So we have these sort of a very two distinctive composition of trends there, um, the upper part, low magnesium, lower part, high magnesium, and then we see a reversal to this low actually in the basal crust of the of the low. At the same time, uh, uh, iron, aluminum, and, and, and calcium, they have show reverse behavior, so they are sort of a relatively high in the upper part and, and, and low in the, in the lower part. Now, irrespective of how, what we think of uh, how commodities are formed, any model that uh, um, will be, you know, is proposed to, to explain the way they form needs to be able to explain the, this compositional variations. Now, the early explanations were that uh, uh, commodity lavas um, 
They were not really lobes. They were big lavas. They were completely liquid lavas that advanced in a turbulent flow regime. And then they stopped. Uh, and uh, you had this supersaturated melt just stagnant there and crystallization started. And because you had a steep thermal gradient uh, from the upper surface to, to, uh, to the interior, you initiated a convection within that lobe. And uh, uh, the highly saturated melt that sank pro supposedly produced the uh, um, olivine cumulate, uh, where the, the polyhedral olivines were growing in suspension, whereas the uh, uh, lighter and more fractionated melt rose up and uh, uh, relatively olivine poor and produced the thin effects um, horizon of the, of the lobe. And the spin effects were predominantly growing downwards. Now, even though this might uh, uh, is conceivably a, a, a plausible explanation, there are a few problems with it. Number one, it does not really explain the random spin effects horizons. Um, and it, if it was formed in this way, then one would assume that uh, with time, the, the residual melt would actually become more and more evolved, regardless of how you do this. It would gradually become more and more evolved, so we would expect to see some kind of a, a composition of gradient in the cumulate towards the top, where the, where the cumulate would become more uh, uh, evolved. And by the same token, you would see the same thing in the, in the, in the spinifex horizon. So that will actually should uh, become more fractionated as we go downwards. Now, the interesting thing is, when people have studied this, is that they, irrespective of where you get sample from the lower part, the uh, composition is fairly uniform, as you see here. So um, that is not consistent with what, what we expect from this kind of a model. And also is that the estimated phosphorate content of this olivine is actually very, very high, so between 94 and 96, um, indicating that they go from a very primitive liquid, all of them. And uh, whereas the uh, uh, also the spin effect zone is actually fairly uniform in composition uh, with uh, olivines or with a significantly less magnesium or in F490 or less. Um, these problems sort of uh, uh, got Rob Hill and his co-workers to suggest that, well, maybe the mode of emplacement is slightly different. Maybe these things are more like what we see in the power hoa flows in Hawaii, where endogenous growth, insulated transport, and lava inflation is a very important mechanism. And these ideas really took off uh, following the paper by Ken Horn in 1994. And uh, here is this model that, that uh, Rob um, developed is shown here in, 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 in this cartoon. So basically it's a, in a flow, laminar flow regime, the, the, it's endogenous growth, so you're basically transporting lava underneath or between two areas of, of more solid materials, which is the upper crust is shown here, and there's a lower part here, which differs from most typical uh, uh, modern day mafia flows in that it actually is full of olivines. And this olivine is in this model taken to represent phenocris that are carried from a magma chamber below. So they actually are already crystallized and they're basically carried by the lava and then they're settling or sedimenting out of the lava as it is moving through uh, through the transport system. And gradually becomes thicker. The uh, the spin effects initially, which forms the random spin effects, is actually when the liquid core is increasing in sync with increasing thickening of the crust. So there is a fair fair amount of stress and 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 uh, uh, sort of a shear stress going on there. So you have end up with random spin effects. when this liquid core reaches a roughly um, uniform thickness because the flux in and out are, are roughly the same, 
then the inflation is entirely due to crustal growth, and that's when the uh, uh, vertical uh, plate benefit starts to grow, and uh, uh, basically the tip of the these crystals is extends into the liquid lava, and you can always get pristine lava coming through it. So those when you add things here to the these crystals, is that it's always growing from from uh, uh, fresh lava, if you like, and the composition will be relatively uniform. And uh, uh, you basically just make space by lifting the crust up, so you gradually inflate, and that's how you lengthen the spinifex. And of course, the uh, the long axis of these crystals is the C axis of the olive. And this is just a, a, another version of an of of, of the same thing, uh, demonstrating how uh, uh, lava inflation might work in Comaria. And uh, again, this is uh, uh, from Rob. Hill in 2001. Now, when you look at uh, uh, any comadiate sequence, you find these sections where you have uh, uh, fairly thin lobes, which have a reasonably thick upper zone of spinifex textured lava, and then underneath it, uh, an olivine orthocumulant uh, uh, portion of, of, of horizon of that thin lava. And Remember this, most of the time when we're looking at these things, we're looking at these things in drill core. Uh, and, but these are very typical sections of, of, of commodity flows, thin flows. Equally as common and, and, and is to find actually these really, really thick sections where, which are dominated by cumulates, mostly meso and ad cumulates. Really, really thick sequences of those things, which are commonly uh, capped by olivine harisite and then by uh, uh, orthocumulants and gabbros. And then very, very top, you have spinifex textures horizon, which are usually relatively th small fraction of the overall thickness of, of, of this section. And Rob Hill interpret this to is uh, really thick cumulate uh, uh, sections to actually represent the lava pathways. Where the uh, uh, the cumulates are basically the carried olivines which are deposited into that pathway, and the spinifex top is basically the roof of that of that pathway. And whereas the uh, um, the spinifex dominated thin lobes are basically lobes that are flanking, representing breakouts from that pathway. And he took it even further, where he developed uh, the concept of uh, a commodity lava flow fields, where you would have, you know, sort of a, 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 a fingering out pathways extending out into, a, you know, in, in many different directions uh, into a, a field of, of spinifex textures or relatively thin lobes. So you would have a, a Flow fascias when you when you're in really proximal path, then you would have uh, big broad pathways where where these accumulate seeds would would dominate. Whereas in the dis, you know with the very distal end, you would have uh, much narrower pathways with which are flanked by fairly substantial sequences of thin spinifex textured lava lobes. And this is sort of illustrated here by this uh, simple animation. So how the uh, Growth of the flow front in a, in a, a commodity lava flow field. The advance, lateral advance, is breakouts from the front of the transport system, lengthening in it in that process, and then you thicken the flow by uh, lateral breakouts from the, from the pathway. And uh, uh, also note that you know you may have more than one pathway active at any one time, so you can end up with fairly complex architecture in these situations. And this brings us back to nickel sulfide ores. And, and, and I just want to bring up here both example from Cosmos and Perseverance. The Cosmos sample here, we can see a massive sulfide body uh, sitting directly on a felsic substrate with some disseminated ore above it. And, uh, um, and this is basically the Cosmos ore body. And the blue line here is actually the pit that was uh, excavated. Uh, as, as they were getting this ore out, but and, and it's a it's a this classical association of commodities and the felsics where the massive 
wall is at, at the very base, and then and we can also have a thermal erosion of this of the substrate that might actually generate the immiscible sulfide that produce this wall. Similar situation here in, in Perseverance, a massive wall body at the base and then disseminated uh, sulfide uh, um, in, in the pathway above, and both of these are flanked by uh, thin, thin textured lobes. Same story at uh, a silver, uh, sorry, a black swan. A silver summer wall body sits, sits here right at the base of the uh, Comadiate formation, um, touching uh, the felsic substrate, both are primary contacts. And uh, uh, this is actually at the base of a major pathway, which is dominated by uh, mesocumulates and, and, and to some extent orthocumulates. All this, these ortho, ortho and mesocumulates, they are actually flanked by, by uh, spinifex textured uh, thin flow lobes. And this is even better seen on, on, on this slide here, where sort of zoomed even further in, we can see the silver swan ore body sitting here in, 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 in sort of an L shaped uh, uh, depression into the underlying dayside domes, there's a, a close, a close associate with this, this hybrid boundary layer, which is produced by melting uh, of the substrate by the commodity at lava at the time of emplacement, as well as this reentrant feature here, which is uh, interpreted to have formed by thermal erosion of, of the felsic substrate. And, and above this, in the, uh, in the cumulative horizon, we have a signet ore body, which is a disseminated ore body, and uh, this is sort of a, a, the typical story. And uh, if we look at this further, here is a, a, a plot from uh, Hill et al. 1999, uh, and this curved line here, solid line, actually shows the degree of contamination by felsic substrate. Uh, as well, as it is modeled, and here is the the chemical analysis of uh, uh, forty four samples from the uh, the the black swan uh, commodia succession, and uh, this is normalized contrast normalized cesium submarine ratio versus uh, zirconium titanium ratio, and to make a long story short, uh, all of these samples show a degree of contaminated by by the felsic, and some of them all the way up to twenty percent. So this led uh, Hill and co-workers to produce this sort of a, a, a schematic uh, um, overview of the formation of the uh, black swan ore body, uh, sorry, black swan commodiate formation and, and the silver swan uh, ore and, and associated ore. So the initial lobe here comes in, uh, establishes a, a trans. A, 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 transport system, a lava tube, if you like, or internal pathway. Uh, further upstream, it thermally erodes, but, and, and uh, uh, reaches sulfur saturation, immiscible sulfide form, and uh, they, those are deposited here as the black dark ore body. Then this next lobe comes in, which is the silver swan lobe, and that one thermally erodes down a bit, and, the, and the, in this area here, deposits the silver swan ore body. We repeat this story a number of times, and in case of the signet ore body, the uh, um, lava in the in the pathway is probably st too stiff for the the immiscible sulfides to sink, so they actually form uh, a disseminated ore body as a sort of dispersed blebs of, of ore throughout the the cumulates. And this is sort of brings it to, towards the end. Basically, the the message here is that um, in terms of nickel sulfide mineralization, the transport system is the key. And the number of things that are quite important in that is, but the primary feature that are of principal importance is that it features narrow chutes and wider pools. And it's in those chutes where you can have relatively high through flow, and you can initiate thermal erosion, which then might result in sulfur saturation and formation of immiscible sulfides, which then will damage up the nickel and, and, and other elements. And whereas the flow comes into the pools, 
it slows down and those sulfide blebs might actually be uh, uh, prone to settle down and form massive ore bodies. If they don't settle down, they might actually form disseminated ore bodies. This is one way you could do it. You might have lava stagnating in those pools. It will start to crystallize and might reach sulfur saturation and form disseminated ore bodies that way. Or it might the system might be reactivated and you get new fresh lava coming into a, a pre-existing lava which is sitting in a pool. That might instigate sulfur saturation and you can form uh, disseminated ore bodies that way. So there are a number of ways you can do it, but at the core of it is the transport system. And in terms of how big those ore bodies uh, can be, then that will solely depend on the size of the pools. And we know that in some of the biggest uh, power hole lavas, and, and if we take this from for the Comariat, the, some of these pools can be kilometers in, 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 in length or diameter. And knowing this, that we, you know, we need to look for the, the transport system, and, and we know the key features of the transport system, it's easy to identify it when it's exposed at the surface, and even easier to find the ore body if it's also exposed at the surface. But if the transport system is only partly exposed at the surface and the ore body is actually in the subsurface, or if both of them are completely in the subsurface, and it can be more difficult to find them. But the flanking flows can then be a key, both the way they are, are formed and also in prime, maybe perhaps uh, predominantly if they're contaminated. If you find contaminated flight flows, then you are probably very close to a pathway that might contain ore. So they can serve as a vector towards the ore. Finally, I mean, endogenous growth, and I hope I demonstrated this, is a fundamental mode of, of lava emplacement on Earth. That's the mode that most lava flows want to go with. They all try to strive towards an insulated transport of the lava. Even AA flows, even though they start out as highly incandescent, they gradually manage to actually insulate themselves. Insulated transport is, 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 is not only the, the most effective way of, of, of making long lava flows, but it's also ideal for sulfide ore forming environments because it's totally sealed off from the external elements. It's insulated. It behaves like a, a closed system. And at the end of this, I think volcanic active commodity levers can be used as a tool to locate uh, and found nickel sulfide ore bodies. Thank you for listening, and I hope you had some fun with this.